Hello everyone, today is Thursday, July 25th, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep your questions relative to the slides and when we get to the live charts feel free to ask about anything else anything that is not a fairly quick answer for those of you who are gold members of the site of davelander.com we'll i'll pick it up in the facebook group we'll have a discussion there and if it requires a lot of thought i'll put together some slides and make that part of the q a and if you're not a member We'll maybe get you a trial so you can attend a Q&A session and get your questions answered. Hold off on your favorite stock picks, but please give me as many as you want when we get to the live charts. But hold off till we get the live charts. And if you don't mind, ask about them one at a time. And this is all for your benefit to make sure that I stay focused and my ADD doesn't kick in. So what are we going to focus on this week? Well, I was looking through a lot of old weekly charts presentations and i woke up before i did that this morning i woke up thinking it's like well i really want to talk about psychology again it's like do i talk about psychology too much and then judging from the emails i get the questions i get and my own trials and tribulations and frustrations i actually think i don't talk about psychology enough and i know everybody's a setup junkie and we're going to get to some market timing and we'll talk about setups and stocks and all these great things in a little while. But the bottom line is if you can get your psychology right, then everything else will fall into place. And I'm gonna help you achieve that goal, I think at least in this presentation. It's certainly, and it's kind of one of those things where we're just gonna scratch the surface today, even though I'm gonna go a little deep in a few subjects, but I think we're just scratching the surface. And as you'll see in this presentation, it's just really, really, Vast, and I think once you take off on that quest, not to necessarily conquer your emotions because that's impossible, as I've talked about before, but just to learn to embrace them and then learn all the psychology. You'll never learn all the psychology, but as you learn more and more, you'll learn more and more pieces that kind of dovetail in, which are going to really help you out. Now, before I begin to filibuster, telling you what I'm going to tell you I'd rather just tell you and then I'm also also want to touch upon simplified market timing we kind of beat the dead horse here over the last several months so there's just a couple things I want to show you I want to show you a system update and a couple little simple things such as moving average Landry light and things like that and we'll get to that in just one second before we do all that there's a screamer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So let's talk about traits of successful traders. And when I originally did this presentation, I got to thinking about it and it's like, well, there's a lot of things that need to be covered. So what I want to focus on today is just the main things that you need to know. And I think that if you get these down, you're well on your way. And again, there's a lot of tangents that come from any one of these, and there's a lot of cognitive biases we must overcome. Before I moved from my old office to my temporary office, I took a picture of my glass board, and this is a psychology project that I've been working on on and off for years, and a lot of things that I want to cover. As I said before, I started working on a psychology course and I ended up with a 14 page to do list just of things I wanted to cover. And a lot of that is on this board here. As you can see, a lot of the cognitive biases, some cost, uh, some neurology, the triune brain, stepping into the unknown, and so on and so forth. And each one of these could be divided out into many, many more. So, obviously, we're not going to be able to cover, cover all of these in this venue today, 
But I'm going to touch upon some of the more important ones. And I think if you could conquer these, or at least embrace these, and I hate to say it, but fake it till you make it, just kind of force yourself to embrace and accept these traits, then you're well on your way. Now, as usual, a lot of the things I present come across as a problem, and I really hate when somebody presents a problem without a solution. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to acquire these traits. The number one thing, and it's something that I know that I beat the dead horse on, but I'm guilty as any for not having patience. A lot of my personality tests that I took revealed that I, I have some serious issues that really aren't conducive for a trader or really are not good <laughs> for a trader to have. And through this personality test, and that's another one of those peeling the onion, learning about myself, and that's something I would strongly urge you to do. But I realized that my agreeableness was pretty much zero, which means that the market should agree with what I'm saying. Otherwise, it, it really aggravates me. And my wife gives me a really hard time about my, my lack of agreeableness. I'm pretty obstinate. Now, there's two forms of patience when it comes to markets. And the first one is to wait for your pitch. Now, I'm a bit not a big sports fan, but I've heard of the term fat pitch before. And I remember several years ago when I first did a presentation similar to this one, I Googled the fat pitch and learned a lot about it. And a lot of the professional baseball players will tell you, the batters will tell you that when you get that fat pitch, the ball actually looks like a cabbage ball coming at you. And it's just a beautiful thing. You have to, to be successful as a hitter, you just have to be willing to wait for that fat pitch. And the same thing applies to trading. Wait until all the ducks are in a row and you think you have the chance to really do something. Years ago, I knew a day trader and he was in and out fairly quickly as a day trader, but he would look at hourly charts, even though he was trading off a 15 minute chart, but he would look at hourly charts, he would look at daily charts, weekly charts, and even monthly charts to stack the odds in his favor. Well, for us, as short to intermediate term trend traders, we want to make sure we have a very solid emerging trend or a very solid established trend. We want to make sure the pullback is deep enough to have knocked some people out or TKO bar is wide enough to have knocked some people out. Or if it's an emerging trend, it's a nice clean bow tie from low levels or a very well-defined first thrust from low levels. And all these other things I preach about day in and day out such as sector confirmation, and within the sector, you want to make sure there's other setups. In other words, stocks are also set up within the sector, or stocks within the sector also look like they have potential or trending, and make sure there's no sexy sisters or brothers, depending on what you're into, or both, <laughs> before taking that trade. So you really have to be patient and wait and wait and wait. And this summer, as most summers, it <laughs> seems like, really try your patience because we just haven't seen a whole lot of setups for most of the summer. Now, speaking of baseball, who do you think holds a record for the most walks? Well, that's Barry Bonds. Now, here we have one of the greatest baseball players of all times. And you could say, but Dave, that's under, he's had performance enhancing drugs. I was like, yeah, I get that. And I think he's in the Hall of Fame with, with that asterisk next to his name. But if you think about it, performance enhancing drugs would not have given him more patience. If anything, just the opposite. So Barry Barnes waited for that fat pitch. And in the waiting and the waiting and the waiting, he ended up walking more than any other baseball player in history. Now, the second form of patience is the patience 
to let things unfold once you take the setup. And that can be tough for many because as you'll soon see, and as I preach ad nauseum, you're gonna spend a lot of time underwater as a trend trader. So this is the last trade that we took in the trading service that complete, the last completed trade I should say. And you can see we had an entry here and then we had a stop down here. And what happened? Well, by the end of day one, we were at exactly break even. 2280 was the entry and closed at 2280 on that day. So it's kind of a scratch. But the next day it traded a little bit higher and closed slightly higher. So we were in the green. But then what happened? Well, for the next week, the trade went back underwater. We lost money on the trade on a net net basis. In other words, the close, the closing prices for a week were less than they were from when we entered. In fact, a week and a day. Then what happened? Well, it began to take off a little bit and we're back in the plus column, but then we begin to give up those gains and went back into the negative column for a long, long time, about six or seven weeks. But Dave, you're a trend trader. Why not get out? Well, I've tried everything over the years, and it seems that my job over the years has been to simplify things and not complicate them. And then I woke up one day and said, you know, I wish I could take trading and really make it simplified. And it's like, oh, you know what? I should trademark trading simplified. And I did. And one way to simplify your trading is saying, okay, well, I've got an entry here. I've got to stop here. I want to make sure everything looks fantastic going in. This is a little IPO deep pullback pattern that we like to trade. So I really liked everything going into this trade. And I think because I have a 0% in agreeableness, I think the market should just take off and go straight up because I enter it, because I'm right, because I'm always right. Well, it didn't do that. And the old me would have gotten out probably on day one or day two or day three, especially if I'm underwater for a few days. However, as I'll kind of talk about in a few minutes, as you'll see in a few minutes, the market doesn't always move in our time frame. We want the best going in, but we have to be willing to accept what the market gives us once we're in. And the easiest way to do that is to just set a stop and go about your life. And that's your plan. I'm gonna stay with this stock until I'm stopped out. But Dave, what if it goes three weeks? Wait until you stopped out. What about three months? Wait until you stopped out. We've had in the past, not a lot, but a few stocks trigger, go absolutely sideways and then get bought out. And I guarantee you most people would have exited long before then. I guarantee you most people did not see this trade to its fruition. Although now that we have the Facebook group, we're working together with each other, as we'll talk about in just a few minutes. And I think that more people now than at any time in history are able to follow the plan because we're helping each other out. But before I digress too far, notice that it did hit the profit target, turn green again, and then what happened? Well, it began to implode, stopped out, and then if you're still holding on and didn't follow the plan, you're now underwater again. Now, this is a somewhat mediocre example because it didn't go to the moon. It would have been great if it did, but this is what I call the better than the poke in the eye trade. In fact, it's much better than the poke in the eye because you got stopped out for a minor gain on the remaining shares. Now, Without digressing too far, you might have noticed, Dave, you gave up a whole bunch of profits. Yeah, I did. But I took initial profits, so my position was half the size of the original position. So I did scale out. And yeah, I gave up a lot. But the ultimate goal is to capture a big, huge winner. Something that's going to double, triple, maybe even quadruple in price. Something that we're going to be in for a long, long time. And the only way to do that is to gradually, the only way to do it without excessive risk, I should say, is to gradually let that stop open up. And in this particular case, when the first correction turns out to be the top, 
then it sucks. And you are going to wish you would have gotten out. Don't let that pride F with you, as Marcellus Wallace says, okay? You just have to follow the plan. And longer term, being willing to give up some of those open profits will allow you to catch the occasional home run and print money. Now, I spent a lot of time telling you that trading isn't easy. And as I say quite often, I could probably make a lot more money in my educational business if I sold out and made it look like it was super duper easy. I tried to explain that to my, <laughs> she's, she's now 19, but I tried to explain it to my, she was a little bit younger, maybe 60 at the time. I tried to explain that to her. And she's like, sell out, sell out. And I'm like, no, no, you missed the whole point of the conversation. But the point is that the trend trader will spend a lot of his time being less wealthy. So a lot of the game is giving up open profits when you take this one step further. Now, let's go back to the, looking back to the toughened trade, let's look at whether you're making money on the trade and that's going to be green or whether you're losing money on the trade. Now, you could be losing open profits and even though you're still profitable overall, you're giving up some of those open profits. So let's look at this entry here and we've got to stop down here. So day one, you're making money. Yay, I'm going to tell all my friends. What happens day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven? you begin to lose money on the trade. In fact, you lose money for a solid week. You begin making money again, but that's only for one day. And then you spend a lot of time giving up those open profits from that max high, okay? So you, you're around $24 a share, and then you trade it below $24 a share for the next month and a half or so. And then the initial profit target was hit. Obviously, it goes green, but it only went green for two days, or you only exceeded your maximum profit for two days. Then you begin giving up those gains. You start hitting new equity highs for a while. Give them up. Start hitting them again. And then obviously, give them up in the end. Now, we didn't know that was going to be the end of the time, but it was. A lot of times, the point I was trying to make earlier is a lot of times you might have a deep correction and that turns into the mother of all tops. Yes, like it did here, but sometimes it will just be a deep correction. It will just be just that and then the stock will take off. And as I said in yesterday's Q&A, today is the 25th in case you're watching the recording, but as I said in yesterday's Q&A, a lot of times I'll look at a stock that I get stopped out on and I'll be angry that I got stopped out because I gave up so much open gains. But then I'll see that same stock a year, two, and maybe even three years later, and it's doubled or quadrupled since I was in the trade. And it makes me realize that even though I was angry that I gave up so much open profits, if I'd have been willing to give up even more open profits, then I might have been able to stick with that trade for a lot, a lot of money. That's what a real money is in the longer term trades. Now, Steve Pressfield, I'm becoming a fan of this guy. I've got a couple of his books here that I need to read, but the first one I read from him was The War of Art, and obviously that's a little play on the art of war. And when you try to accomplish something in life, as you motivated people do, you're going to hit resistance. And it's not so much the resistance that's externally, which there's going to be a S-ton of that. It's more of the internal resistance that you're going to feel. So Mr. Pressfield defines resistance as any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity, and that will elicit resistance. Now, his book, The War of Art, is very small. You could probably read it in one setting, very, you know, just one little paragraph per page, but very good book. Well, 
as I was hinting at earlier, or talked about earlier, the trading psychology is truly like peeling the onion. Well, I read his book, which he defines this thing called resistance, and then I later learned there's something called acrasia, which is pretty much what he's saying. So acrasia is like you're willing to give in to that temptation. Well, let's just step out of sight of trading for a second. You're thinking, I'm going to have that sweet or whatever, even though I'm on a diet, because that feels that's going to feel really good and give me some sort of immediate gratification. Well, in trading, obviously, you're going to want to lock in profits for fear they might evaporate, even though you should stay with the trade longer term, hopefully weeks, months, years. Or you may get out of a trade because you feel like it's dead money because it's going sideways. Now, getting back to acrasia, which sounds a lot like what, what Mr. Pressfield was talking about, acrasia is defined as a state of mind in which someone acts against their better judgment through the weakness of will. And as you saw with that glass board, and there's a lot more that wasn't on that glass board that I showed earlier, when you get into the trading psychology, you, you kind of end up in a rabbit hole, but it's a good rabbit hole because one thing is kind of connected to another, and then that's connected to three more things. And then a year or two later, you discover something like acrasia, which is sort of connected to all of these things. So that's one reason why I'm often late in my presentations is because I just keep thinking of more and more things that, that need to be part of the presentation as they relate to the trading psychology. So getting back to the patience, you have to have the patience to let the market come to you. And then once you're in, you have to have the patience to let the market move and let the chips fall where they may. Now, one of the problems with Jesse Livermore is once you start quoting him, it's nearly impossible to stop. But Livermore once said, it was never my thinking that made the big money. For me, it was always sitting. Now, I've kind of vacillated back and forth as to what he means here, and I don't think you have to define it as one or the other. A lot of people say he's talking about sitting what's in a position, and a lot of people say he's talking about sitting it out, waiting for the move. And I think he's talking about both. And if you read Reminiscence, and if you haven't read it yet, you're either brand new to trading or shame on you. So do read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And then he went on to say money is made by sitting, not trading. Now, in this particular instance, you could argue that it could be one or the other or both. But I think he's possibly talking about sitting in a trade that you need to sit in. So obviously, we go back to the last, just so happens our last stock worked out perfectly. For example, today. If you would have given up on it, then you wouldn't have made any money. Don't give me timing, give me time. And that's that's the hard part. We want it all, and we want it now, as Queen once sang. And that song's in my head this morning for some reason. But don't give me timing, give me time. I feel 100% confident if... I could be patient enough, which might mean waiting for months and months. I could do extremely well or will do extremely well. I will find some huge winners, but it's the in the meantime where I could be my own worst enemy. And I think we all have that problem. Uh, when I go into a drawdown, as I've said quite a bit, I'm, I do wear my emotions on my sleeves quite a lot. I'm a very emotional guy, which is not really a good trade for a trader, but I have to work through that, and I have to embrace that and live with that. But when I go through a drawdown, my wife knows it, not because she's checking my account statements, but because of my attitude, and she just flat out knows. And she's always saying, she always asks me the obvious, when will you come out of that? And I'm like, I don't know. And you would think after being in this business 30 years or whatever, you would know, but you don't. You don't know. You just have to keep chipping away at it and follow the process. So don't give me timing. Give me time. A man may see straight and clearly 
and yet become impatient or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing as he figured it must do. Well, that goes right back to that TUFN trade. I thought it was headed higher. I thought it was going to head higher right away. It did not. It took its time. Okay? Now, that would be a much better example if it turned into the mother of all trends. But it's still an okay example if you can occasionally make money on a trade while occasionally losing money on a trade, which you will do. Make a little, lose a little. Just trying to keep your head above the water, which a lot of trend trading is, which I'll get to in one second before I jump too far ahead. But if you can kind of hang in there, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, make a little, little lose a little, and not give up, and then, bam, you're going to head it out of the park down and then on one or two big trades. And all it takes is one or two big trades to make a year. So a man may see straight and clearly and yet become impatient or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing as, it, as he figured it must do. The market does not beat them. And that's something that I've been kind of beating my dead horse, beating my dead horse. <laughs> One day they'll find I, have, I beat a horse to death. Um, the market does not beat them. And, and I beat the dead horse on this quite often. The market does not exist. It is not good or bad. It exists in your mind. Because if you're not an active participant of, let's say, some thin or choppy market or some market that you don't trade, like Coco, we talk about quite a bit, then that market, whether it goes up or down, you don't care. So the point there is, and I've spent a lot of time developing this, but the point there is that the market exists in your own head and it cannot... It cannot force you to feel good. It cannot force you to feel bad. So as Liverpool says, the market does not beat them. They beat themselves because though they have brains, they cannot sit tight. So I think it's pretty obvious here what Livermore is saying, to sit in the trade until you're proven wrong. Now, I've tried to outsmart the market in 10,000 different ways and to get me out of bad trades and keep me in good ones. And all I could figure out was just use a stop. Let the stop take you out if you're wrong or keep you in if you're right. I got one right now, and I'm looking over at my screen, and I can see it's, it's having an okay day today. And maybe that's the bottom, and maybe it's going to keep going up. But I've been underwater in this trade for weeks, and it's been pissing me off. It really has been pissing me off. But I know that... I'm going to stick with it until I'm stopped out. And one reason I'm kind of forced, which we're going to get to in just one second, but it's going to be, it's because of accountability, because I told my Facebook peeps that I was taking the trade and I took the trade. And now it's like I have to live by the sword, die by the sword. If it stops out, well, it stops out. I'm going to drop an F bomb and I'm going to scream next. If it, rallies up, it hits the initial profit target, and then it stops out, it's better than the poke of the eye, and I'm going to say, you know what, I follow the plan, and this is what happened, better than the poke of the eye. And then if it turns around, or it keeps turning around, I should say, it goes straight up, I take additional profit targets, and then trail the stock for a long, long time, then once again, I've just followed the process. Unfortunately, as you know, and once again, I make a lot more money if I made it look easier, but as you know, you're going to be wrong a lot, and occasionally you will get stopped out at a loss. In fact, more than occasionally, more than I would like, or more than anyone would like. Now, this is a dated slide. This goes back about a year and several months. But what's interesting is we will have sideways markets. Again, if the market does not continue to break out, then we're kind of in this sideways soup I've been fearing and talking about quite a bit lately. But as you can see here, back in March of 18, if the trading wasn't going well as a trend trader, which I'm sure it wasn't, we might have had a few shorts on back then, I don't remember. But just look at the chart and realize that 
for a long, long time, the market had gone sideways, at least on a net net basis, and not made much progress. So it was around 2,600, and then many months later, it was around 2,600. Now, during less than ideal conditions, in other words, if the market on a net net basis has a guard anywhere, if you can't find a setup to save your life, and that's the database talking, and that could be very important, paying attention to that database, then I would urge you to keep yourself extremely busy outside of the markets. Now, what I force myself to do is a lot of research because I'm here anyway, and but I've got to be careful not to get sucked into the siren call of day trading or just try to squeeze off a trade out of boredom or whatever to try to make something happen. Don't give me timing. Give me time. But I would urge you to keep yourself busy outside of the markets. I do take breaks on occasion. I will go get on my bike and ride for a couple of hours or jump on a Peloton for an hour. And then now part of my holistic trader trying to practice what I preach. There's a gym which turned out to be about a two mile bike ride from my house. So I'll hop on the bike, ride to the gym, work out and ride back. So I get four extra miles and I'm gonna go to the gym. So that takes time, an hour or so. So that's an hour or so I'm not watching the markets. As I said in a recent column, I was looking at some intraday charts and I can all but guarantee you what's going to happen next is I'm going to fire off an unnecessary day trade. And then my wife stuck her head in my office and said, lunch. And I'm like, you know what, babe? I could sit here and watch this stupid screen all day, ruin my eyes, and do a little damage to my trading account, more than likely from overtrading or micromanaging, or I can go to lunch with you. And that lunch costs a lot less than losing an ass ton of money in the markets. Now, as I often preach, you want to take the can't stand it test. Do you really think you have the mother of all setups? So if you really, really, really like a setup, then you need to take it. Anything less than that, you need to really consider whether or not you're going to take that setup. Now, again, once you start quoting Livermore, hard to stop. I let the craving for excitement get the better of my judgment. The desire for constant action, irrespective of underlying conditions, is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even among professionals who feel that they must take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. As I often preach, there are no income producing methodologies, at least not longer term. And William Eckert once said, what feels good over the short term works disastrously, paraphrasing him obviously, over the long term. So take a little profits here and there and some of these trades that You'll think, oh, well, this one didn't take off, so I'm glad I took partial profits. That makes a lot of sense. The market's a bad teacher. I bet you thought I could get through a presentation without saying that, huh? I couldn't get through a presentation without saying that. But a lot of that is going to happen. It's going to be tempted you. It's going to tempt you to do those things. And the things that feel good over the short term, well, what are we coming back to? We're kind of circling back to a crazy. Okay, I was in the grocery store yesterday. Zaps chips are pretty freaking amazing okay the jalapeno zap chips which my wife turned me on to are phenomenal and you you dip those in some sour cream oh i'm getting hungry just thinking about it i'm craving that okay i also noticed that the beer aisle had some interesting looking beers and yeah, interesting we were at walmart Interesting for Walmart, which does which is not known for carrying craft beers. So it's like I'm thinking like, well, what would it hurt tonight if I just had some chips and beer? And it's like, well, it would hurt, but it's hard not to give in to that short-term temptation. It's, it's hard not to have that acrasia 
rear its ugly head. So one thing you need to wrap your head around is when a market is just chopping back and forth or going sideways or you can't find setups, as Livermore said, remember this, when you're doing nothing, those speculators who feel they must trade day in and day out are laying the foundation for your next venture. You will reap the benefits from their mistakes. Well, you can kind of take this at a literal sense and say, well, if, if people are trading back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, that could actually make a base. And a lot of times you have some really good patterns that can develop after a base is made. First pullback after a base breakout, great pattern to trade. And I thought we were down with Livermore, but obviously he's rearing his ugly head once again. I guess that's not a nice way to call Mr. Livermore. The reason is that a man may see straight clearly and yet become impatient or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing as he figured it must do. The market does not beat them. They beat themselves because though they have braids, they cannot sit tight. Old turkey. Well, turkey neck was bullish. Why was turkey neck bullish? Well, turkey neck was probably the original trend following moron because the market was going up. If you read Reminiscence, they talk about turkey neck. And old turkey neck, because he had a turkey neck, was bullish. And did you say, hey, turkey neck, which way the market's headed? He goes, well, after all, we are in a bull market. Old Turkey was dead right in doing and saying what he did. He not only had the courage of his convictions, but the intelligent patience to sit tight. Disregarding the big swing and trying to jump in and out was fatal for me. Me too. Nobody could catch all the fluctuations. In a bull market, your game is to buy and to hold on until you believe that the bull market is near its end. Now, one thing that I often say is there's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. If you go back to that second TUFN chart, that Tuffin chart, notice that most of the time you were giving up, you were either at an outright loss or you were giving up profits in the trade. So you think to yourself, self, this is a dead money trade. Maybe I need to get out of this market and if you start that game you're going to find plenty of reasons to exit and very few reasons to stick with it but stick with it you must and i know it's easier said than done but all you have to do is just honor that stop if it hits a stop you have to get out if it doesn't hit the stop you have to stay in now you have to be accountable when it comes to trading. And this is a biggie. And this is probably one of the biggest traits that a trader has to have. Now it's time for Ein Geschiffen. Let's try it again. Ein Geschiff. Anybody here German can say this? <laughs> Ein Geschiffen von Sway Hanlan. That's probably not right. What I'm trying to say, and it might not even be the correct translation, but I thought it'd be cute right before I went public, went public, went live, is a tale of two traders. When I was in Germany a few years back speaking, they were two traders. One was very successful, one was not. Did one have a superior methodology over the other? You might ask. Well, you probably think that's probably why. So two traders, one was profitable, one was not. Did one have a better methodology than the other? And the answer was no. Now, one was a prior world-class poker player. One was a professional player. So I guess in that sense, he had an edge. But the bottom line was they were trading partners, and they were trading the same exact system. And one was following the system and one was not. And I'd be willing to bet if the unsuccessful trader would talk to his friend and say, you know what, I want you to hold me accountable for my trades. If I get out early, I want you to 
beat me up on that. And then maybe figure out some sort of punishment or reward for doing that. Now, it sounds a little weird, but I'll give you an example. A friend of mine years ago was getting a little fluffy, like we all tend to do from sitting around looking at our screens all day. And he decided to get serious about it, about his weightlifting. So he found someone that he knew that was younger than him, that was fit, that was dedicated to working out. And he told the guy, look, I want you to ride by my house every morning at 7 a.m. If I'm not sitting on my front porch waiting for you to pick me up to go to the gym, I'm going to give you $20. So my friend might decide to sleep in, but he knows it's going to cost him 20 bucks. And then the kid that he had picking him up was pretty excited about, right? Probably got to his house about 6.59 or maybe even earlier, waiting to see whether he was going to come out on that porch at 7 o'clock or not. So you have to commit to being accountable. Now, Rotella in Elements of a Successful Trader, and I'm going to have to reread the psychology section of that book. I really liked it. It, as I've said quite often, I read the psychology section at a time that I was going through a hard time in my trading, a drawdown. And I later read that Mr. Rotella himself was going through a hard time in his trading. And now he looks, he seems to be doing okay based on the Rotella Capital Management website where I was able to find this picture. You do not have to explain reasons to a higher official to escape censure. That a lot of our jobs, for those of us who have jobs, but a lot of our jobs, people with jobs, they have to explain why or why not something worked or didn't work. Well, in trading, you just have yourself. You only have to explain to yourself. You have a far harder task. You must instead justify your actions to yourself. Let's start from the top. You do not have to explain reasons to a higher official to escape censure. You have a far harder task. You must instead justify your actions to yourself. There's no way to hide when trading because you always stand alone. And answering to yourself is tough, and answering to others is even tougher, but you have to be willing to set up that commitment device yourself. Now, if you find yourself not holding yourself accountable, would you be brave enough to have someone hold you accountable? And I use the word brave. Now, I've told this story a thousand times, and I'll probably tell it a thousand more. Now, Dr. John's actually doing pretty good now. Dr. John, he did a lot of somewhat drastic things to improve his trading. But Dr. John is a good trader. He's been on my trading service forever. He's been a good client, and he does really well following along with my stuff. Sometimes in the past, he's given up and then come back in right before, of course, he gives up right before a big trend incurs and then comes back in right after. And then once he does finally catch the big trends, he tends to get a little bit, or used to at least, get a little bit careless at his trading and overtrade a little bit and day trade a little bit. And you've probably heard a thousand Dr. John stories over the year, well, whether or not I call him by name or not. But in one of our talks, before he took some serious commitment device type of action, but in one of our talks, I said, look, you know what you're doing. You're a pretty good stock picker, whether you're taking stocks off my Landry list or not. You're pretty good at finding your own stocks. You understand the money management. You understand where the stops should be placed. You understand how to execute. You just go off the rails every now and then. You try to make something happen in less than ideal conditions. You throw on 20 or 30 day trades, which wipe out all your trend trades and a host of other bad behavior. And I said, would you be willing to get your wife involved and say, honey, this is what I'm doing. I'm following this trend following moron guy. It's simplified trend trading. We're going to only trade the best setups. This is what a good setup looks like. Stock has to be trending and persisting and 
not have gaps against the setup and not too many gaps against the trend itself. And other stocks in the sector have to be trending and the sector overall should be trending and the market should be trending. And we're just going to follow along. We might be wrong, so we're going to put a stop in. And we might be right little, so we're going to take partial profits. And if we're right big, we'll still be in the position and make a lot of money. In other words, give the wife the entire plan. And what he said next kind of surprised me. He said, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So he knew deep down that he had a problem. And that's the first, you know, channeling Kettering or Kettering, a problem well stated or as the way I like to look at it, a problem recognized is a problem half solved. So holding yourself accountable is tough. And Doug Hershon once said, asking to be held accountable isn't a sign of weakness. It's an indication that you know yourself. It's actually a sign of strength. Okay, I know myself. I need to be held accountable. Okay, well, I know myself. I need to be held accountable. That's why I publicly talk about stocks or recommend stocks in my trading service. And I know that I need to take the trades I recommend, honor the stops where they are, take the partial profits when they're hit, because you guys are looking over my shoulder, so to speak. And in the Facebook group, the same thing. When I talk about an IPO and I say I'm going to take it, I take it. When it begins to drop and it drops, it hits my stop, I need to get out. Because you guys would be like, Dave, what happened with that? It's like, Ugh. well, you know, turned out to be a turd, but I'm out. No more harm can come to my account from that stock anymore. And on the flip side, if it works out, it works out. And I'm following along. Now, good traders are accepting. If anyone, if any of you have, ever, have had kids, you know, one of the sayings is you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. You have to be willing to accept what the market gives. And as I often say, I use that little sad kids photo quite often because all trades eventually end badly. You're either going to get stopped out, you're either going to make a little, but then get stopped out, which is okay. And as I often say, people get mad at me. Well, Dave, we gave it the, those open profits. It's like, yeah, but you made money overall. Why don't you send me the money if it's pissing you off? And so far, nobody has sent me any money from a trade that worked that they didn't want to, that they were angry with. So, again, getting back to this tough and trade, we're kind of beating a dead horse here. But you can see that it hit the initial profit target and then it stopped out. Well, both of those levels are higher than you got in. And if you look at the spreadsheet based on a hypothetical 100K account, just to, it has to be hypothetical because all of this is for educational purposes only. I did take this in an account that I personally have that's close to 100K. And I did trade just about exactly as I have here. I say just about, my share size was probably slightly larger, but not by much, not enough to make a difference. Anyway, so it's 13.16 per 100K or 1.13% on your account. Well, you win the trade for a couple of months or so, but that's not bad, 1.31% gain. So it's better than a poke in the eye. You have to be willing to accept this. And not get too excited about what you gave up, gave up, but feel good about what you've made. Because longer term, you will do fantastic by giving these things a little bit of room to breathe. Because sooner or later, you're going to capture the mother of all trends. Now, along the same lines of you get what you get, you don't throw a fit, you also have to be gracious when it comes to markets. You thank the market for giving you the profit, even if it's a small one, and you have to be willing to move on. A lot of people obsess over what they gave up, and they're so busy doing that, they miss the next great trade. Now, you have to be agnostic. What is, is, as I preach, don't confuse the issue with facts. So, 
again, I know I've said this a thousand times, unless you're Bill Clinton, again, what is, is. The price of the stock, the ask, is the lowest amount that someone will sell it to you. And the value of the stock is the bid, and that's what someone will pay you for it. Now, a good trait of a trader would be that they are planners. And Mike Tyson, or Mike Tyson's manager, as some say, either way, once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Well, you have to be willing to get punched in the face in this business. Good traders are also very disciplined. And this is where that acrasia comes in, doing the right thing now versus succumbing to some sort of temptation, whether that be through boredom or trying to outsmart the market or whatever. Now, one thing that I've been really obsessing over the last few years is that trading and life is all about the micro. You make a really big mistake over a short period of time, and that's gonna haunt you for the rest of your life. You text someone when, if, you're in a, if somebody expects you to reply back quickly, you married guys, you know what I'm talking about, then don't pull over if you have to, but don't text that person back. We're all tempted to do it. I think we probably all have done it once or twice. But that small micro decision could affect your entire life or possibly even the life of someone else. And I'm not sure why I brought up that example other than since I've gotten into biking on the actual road as opposed to my exercise bike, I've done a bike on and off for years but now I'm getting a little serious about biking on the road where there's traffic on occasion, especially doing these. I try to stay off the road on traces and stuff, but occasionally we have to cross highways and such. And a lot of times I'll get to these crosswalks, even though there's a stop sign, and I'll see people on their phones texting and they'll blow right through the stop sign. So even though I have the right of way, I don't wanna be dead right, okay? So that's probably why I use that example. But getting back to trading, you're going to be tempted. You're going to, you're going to have pride as, again, getting back to Marcellus Wallace, that, that's pride that's going to be effing with you. You're going to say, well, I don't want to lose those open profits, so I'm just going to lock them in. And, of course, the next day you watch the market take off without you. So it's a lot about the micro. It's a lot about what you're doing at the moment. Take the time to place the order. Like this morning, right before my presentation, I'm like, oh crap, I need to check my orders. It's like, well, let me put that stop in. It's like, well, it's not, it's not anywhere near the stop. It's doing fine. Do I have to worry about that? Yes, let me put the stop in. Let me make sure that I have the orders in for today to trigger me in should the stock take off for a potential new position to stop me out should the stock implode from an existing position. Now, good traders are humble and kind of beat the dead horse on this, but it's I seem to be, and I'm getting better at this, but the recent batch of scumbags out there, they seem to be more, what word am I looking for, brazen, I guess, than ever. And getting back to Mr. Pressfield, one of the things that he said that I that really made me a fan of his is the counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. And that's, once again, from the War of Art. And I remember when I first put this presentation together a few years back, by chance, there was this guy selling stuff, and he's... Like, look at me, I'm riding around with a big-breasted woman in a Lamborghini. A big, fake-breasted woman, I guess I should add, in a Lamborghini. It's not that easy, unfortunately. So the humble traders don't post their P&Ls. They don't brag about what they made, and it's not even noon. I just made $10,000, it's not even noon. That's actually one of the ads that comes up on Facebook quite often. And they don't post pictures of themselves standing in front of Lambos. How'd that get in there? 
as I said before, that is a real Lamborghini, okay? And that is Big Dave next to it. Like, why do you call you Big Dave? I was like, well, <laughs> look at the scale on this thing. Isn't that crazy? It looks like a Matchbox car. Big Dave's working on that. He's still going to be big no matter what, though. Being flippant is something that I talk about often. I'm not sure if I define it well, but you just sort of have to not care. I know, easier said than done. You have to kind of take a what is, is, so what attitude. I, a while back, I talked about Curtis Faith. I'm Curtis Faith. He's, he's a bit of a colorful character if you Google him. But he was one of the original turtles. And he made a boatload of money, and he eventually blew up. But in an interview, they asked him, like, well, you made all this money, and you blew up. And his point was that he didn't care. And had he not, if he would have cared, he wouldn't have made the money in the first place. So what does that mean? Well, he was following a system that had tremendous drawdowns. And he just didn't care. He was able to just blindly follow the system where others couldn't follow it, so they never made the money in the first place. Now, obviously, I don't recommend you rush out and do pure trend trading unless, of course, you've taken a, a little bit more of a hybrid approach, or I should say a hybrid approach to your money management if you're going to do a pure trend trading. But take that trend trading one step further and don't just buy a blindly buy a breakout. Find a pattern that you think has a little bit better edge, such as a reversion to the mean within a trend, in other words, a pullback, a TKO, or something like that. But you have to reach a point where you don't really care about what you're trading. I often do not know, other than what sector the company is, what the company does. If I'm trading Forex, I don't know whether I'm long or short this market or that market or what currencies I actually have to look to see. You have to be willing to take the necessary action without remorse. Now, a lot of the things I'm telling you are a lot of things I aspire to do because I'm still emotional, as I have said throughout this presentation. One thing that I've learned is instead of having hope when a position isn't going my way, I actually feel good when a, a stinker stops out because I'm not flippant and, and agnostic all the time. I get a little angry when markets don't go my way because I lack agreeableness. I have like a zero in agreeableness. So there are times when I get knocked out of position. I'm like glad. Okay, screw you. I'll go find another one. I say in my, what's his name, Paul Giamatti as John Adams. I say it in my best Paul Giamatti as John Adams voice, I say good day, sir. <laughs> and sometimes that interjecting my own humor helps me to get through that. Now, you know you're going to see this quite often. I've never heard this term before until recently, and I think it's a fantastic term. I often talk about you have to be an, an aseptic. You have to take an antiseptic view to markets. Well, this is an actually better way of saying it, clinically dispassionate. A clinically dispassionate psychologist is able to li listen to the problems of a client and not become emotionally involved. Larry Williams once said, to make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. It's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. The more you're clinically dispassionate and less attached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. Amen, my brother, from another mother. Now, you have to be even keeled. Easier said than done. One thing you can sort of do, and a lot of these things I've learned from Mark Douglas over the years, is in being that detached and, and working to be clinically dispassionate, is you could say, Instead of an F-bomb, maybe say, well, that's interesting. I know, you just said it done. But one of the things I think Douglas, I'll give him credit, I'm pretty sure it was Douglas said, is 
you have to sort of see it like viewing a movie, like it's happening but not happening to you. Now we're students, we never stop learning. And the more you know about the markets, the more you realize you don't know, and then the more control you realize you don't have. As I talked about last week, I woke up with this epiphany, I'm gonna draw this curve, what you think you know and what you actually know, it's like you're, what you actually know, what you think you know, just go straight up at first, and then all of a sudden you get humbled and realize you don't know as much as you think you know. And then you reach a point where after a long, long time, you'll actually know more than you think you know. And that's that's when the true enlightenment happens. When those two curves cross, what you think you know, what you actually know, that's when you become successful. Now, like a lot of things in the markets and a lot of my epiphanies, I think I discover something, and then I find out that someone talked about that a lot a long time ago, long before I ever discovered it. And that's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And that's where your confidence is super high because you think you know it, and then in reality you don't. But over time, you learn to give up control, accept, accept what is, and just follow along. So as I said recently, it's the Socratic paradox. I know that I know nothing, which some people say isn't Socrates, but it sounds like something Socrates would say. So you reach a point where it's not that you know that you know nothing, because you will learn a lot about markets and their behavior, but you know nothing about the true outcome of what will happen. And that's where the money management kicks in. As I often say, money management will cure a multitude of sins. So I've been preaching throughout, just use a stop. Use a stop, go on a bike ride. Use a stop, take your wife to lunch. Okay, that's all you have to do. And if you should not be in that position, the market will stop you out. If you should stay in that position, the market will keep you in. The stop order will keep you in. Easier said than done. The other thing too, that's that I often forget to say, is never forget garbage in, garbage out. Your best defense, and defense is important, and money management is crucial, beat the dead horse on it quite often, but your best defense is often a good offense. If you pick it the best to begin with, then a lot of times it'll just all fall into place. Another trait of a trader is they have commitment. And commitment is whatever it takes to make a person engage or continue a course of action when difficulties or positive alternatives influence a person to abandon the action. I'm getting hungry <laughs> doing this presentation. When I do a presentation, I get hungry. I have two options when I'm done. I can eat a little snack, maybe something healthy, then go to gym, or I could go pick up some fried catfish. I want to go get those fried, I want to go get fried catfish, but I'm going to resist. So whatever it takes to make that makes a person engage or continue a course of action when difficulties or positive alternatives influence the person to abandon the action. So a commitment device will allow you to avoid that acrasia effect, avoid that short-term temptation. So again, go to lunch, okay, or go work out. Just remove yourself from the screens. James Clear, who I learned about acrasia from, and his book is Atomic Habits, a little short book, good book. Do the right thing in the future by making bad habits difficult in the present. Okay, so the example that I, the blazing example here, or the blatant example here, would be Dr. John told me one day that to stop his day trading, he moved his trading account over to a wealth management firm where he uh, we also had some pro some other accounts and he didn't want to look like a lunatic calling in his trades all day 
So that immediately stopped his day trading. So sometimes it takes something a little bit more drastic, but sometimes not so much. Sometimes you just walk away. So if you feel the siren call of day trading, micromanaging, or anything else outside of your plan or core methodology, turn off your screens. Sometimes that's all you have to do. Go for a walk, a bike ride, go to the gym. Take your wife or a significant other to lunch. As I often say, you probably don't want to take them both at the same time. Who am I to judge? <laughs> but I'm thinking that if you do have that situation, trading, you might want to tap the brakes on trading. You've got other things to worry about. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the micro is more important than the macro. Now, in order to trade, obviously you're going to need some help. No one is self-made. I've done presentations before where I've gone through all the people that have helped me throughout my career. Greg Morris, Larry McMillan. I've got some stuff from Larry Williams just recently. That's why I wanted to say Williams. Greg Morris, Linda Rasky. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I have a column out there with probably 100 names in there. Charlie Kirk. Uh, we all get help, okay? And that's okay. And I've been getting a lot of help from the Facebook group. You guys have pointed out some great IPOs in fairly recent times. Not recent, recent, but since we've had the Facebook group up and running. And you guys have helped me to follow my plan, so thank you. Now, obviously, you're going to need some money. And if you can't afford to trade, then I think you could still learn without money. But once you have money, then you're going to have skin in the game. And it's going to make the psychology is going to kick in in a much bigger way. You're going to need the support or approval of significant others trying to do it without that you're going to be doomed from the start. And of course, a lot of patience and willing to commit to do what's necessary. And that's the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever do. It's hard to not exit a stock when it goes sideways. It's hard to not exit a stock when it hits your stop. You might start reasoning, well, maybe it's oversold. Maybe I'll trade out of it. Maybe it'll bounce. You really have to commit to just follow the plan. I know. That's all you have to do. Easier said than done. Now, one thing to help you overcome the micro is in every action, you have to ask yourself, are you moving toward or away from your longer term goal? We have this time inconsistency, meaning that we don't really focus too much on what happens short term because we all have these longer term goals in the back of our head. But that micro is more important than the macro. And you have to ask yourself, are you moving toward or away from your goal? And if you're moving away from the goal, you're doing things like following your greed and your fear. If you're moving toward, you're following the process. So Greed and fear would be something like micromanagement. Following the process would be being patient. Following the process, you're going to pick the best. Following fear and greed, you're a trade for activity. Following the process, honor your stop. Following greed and fear, hold and hope. That's after the stop gets hit. Obviously, you're going to abandon your plan. And that's going to move you away from your goal. And all you have to do, I know, easier said than done, is just follow your plan if you want to move toward your goal. All right, so we covered a lot of ground. And that's the problem, as I said earlier, with trading psychology. You find yourself going off on a lot of tangents because it's all interrelated. All right, any questions on all that? Yes, Don, that's exactly who I'm talking about. But I'm not going to call him by name, you know. Don has figured out who I'm talking about, just these BS guys. That's okay. I mean, you know, one of them in that organization is, has been indicted for embezzling three quarters of a million dollars. And although that has nothing to do with trading, being disingenuous about trading, it just shows the company they keep, okay? All right, real quick, just want to update you on a couple of simple market timing systems. This is the TFM 10% system. I beat the dead horse on this in prior weeks. 
So no need to go through the system itself, but you can see that it got long, or it triggered a buy signal, I should say, in March of this year, which has been 146 days long, and so far the market has risen 8%. Now, I'm not suggesting you rush out and trade a mechanical system. I am a 100% discretionary trader, FYI, but it is kind of cool to have some sort of quantitative indicator or whatever you want to call it system to maybe wake you up that the trend may be turning or things might be improving. So in this particular case, back in March, I, if memory serves, I was still pretty bearish. In fact, I know I was because somebody in a Facebook group pointed out, hey, Dave, you have a TFM 10% system buy. I'm like, no, there, no, there's not. There's no way it could be a buy given the condition of this particular market. And lo and behold, it was. So it's a game of clues. And sometimes you need something like this, even though I don't suggest you rush out and trade it mechanically. But sometimes this objective type of indicator or system will help keep you in the market. Okay, question a little bit outside of what we're talking about, but I'll answer it real quick. The question from Don is, is your stop always two points from entry? No. The stop is always 2% if stopped out. So I would encourage you to go through the money management course. It's all in there in a lot of painstaking detail. But that means, let's say you determine your stop. Let's say you determine your stop is five points away from your entry, in some cases, it might be 10 points away from your entry. Well, trade the amount of shares. Let's say you have a $100,000 account. You'd risk 2% of that account, which is $2,000, divided by your stop. Let's say it's five. Then you would buy 400 shares, okay? Look at some of the archives of the trading service spreadsheets, okay? And that'll help you out. So real quick, this is the Landry Light. And all this does is measure the number of days that the <laughs> sound like a radio now a radio talk show guy talking slow to fill the time. I'm just trying to get my pen set up. That's what I'm doing, in case you're wondering. So this measures the number of days or counts the number of days more accurately that the lows are greater than the moving average. In this particular case, I use a 50-week moving average, and this is a weekly chart. So you can see that for a long, long time, these lows were greater than the moving average. That's what I call a Landry light. And then eventually right here, you touch the moving average, and that's why this comes back in. Based on empirical research, when you get close to 100, this is 100 right here. When you get close to 100, the market tends to correct. Doesn't mean I'm gonna exit all my positions, but I need to be a little prudent in my profit taking, partial profit taking, et cetera. And if you look at a long-term chart of this, you'll see that it stays red for a long, long time, especially, or it stays red for a long time, usually right before a big bear market, and then stays red throughout the bear market, and then green throughout the bull market. Nothing magical about that, probably the simplest indicator in the world. And yeah, Don, I wasn't beating you up. I just want to make sure that you fully understand before you put your hard-earned money in the markets, you need to fully understand the risk that are involved and how we approach money management. And if that works for you, then by all means use it. If not, then I understand. But I think after 20-something years of doing this, I have a, a grasp of what works, at least for me. Anyway, we had major weekly bow ties. We did have one recently that did not trigger. A major weekly bow tie comes off of all-time highs. And the last one that did trigger was 2015-2016. And as I've said, a nausea. The Rusty, the Russell 2000, had a really uh, bad spill afterwards. So this is the hourly bow tie. And the reason I show this is that patterns are fractal. And when you'll notice that we did have, it was a little sloppy, meaning that it wasn't tight. This would be a tight bow tie right here. See how they all come together? This was a little sloppy, but it was a bow tie nonetheless. And if you did take the trade, entry would have probably been here somewhere or whatever. And you may have gotten a little bit out of it, but nothing to get too excited about. The point I was trying to make here 
is that when you do see a bow tie, especially a tight bow tie after all time highs on an hourly chart, just pay attention just in case it's the start of something much bigger. Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, Susie will be right there in just one second. In fact, if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. So where's winter? I don't think it's coming, at least not yet. So let's take a look at that. Let's get to the charts. Yeah, keep them coming. We're gonna. I'm gonna have to rush through them because Chief Orman was really wound up today. <laughs> Let me just walk you through the market really, really quick, and then we'll get we'll get to those stock picks. One of my big concerns lately with the Nasdaq has been with the S&P too, but more specifically the Nasdaq has been the fact that oh we lost it. We'll start with the P's then been the fact that we really haven't cleared the prior peaks that decisively. Again, this is especially true in the NASDAQ. So if you look at the prior peaks in the market, you can see we've finally gotten to new highs fairly decisively yesterday. We're giving it up a little bit today, but that's okay. On a micro level, yeah, we got a little tiny double top. Let's not get too excited about that. My big concern has been that we haven't cleared these prior peaks decisively. And the reason that's a big concern is if you have a few big down days, you're back into this longer term sideways suit. Your net net price change is nil. But so far, so good. Now, yesterday, the NASDAQ had a fantastic day. Unfortunately, we're giving up a little bit of that today, which is fine. However, you want it to stop somewhere. Notice recently it kind of broke out, came back in. If it drops much below 8,100, then all bets are off, at least for now. But so far, so good. We're kind of breaking out the new levels. We're probably a little bit overbought in here, but that's okay. The Russell took off yesterday, give it up a little bit yesterday. But big concern here, as I've said, ad nauseum, is that you take a look at a weekly chart. It still has that big picture weekly retrace look to it until and unless it goes on the bang on new highs, or at least get past this retrace, I would be very cautious. Semiconductors busted out to new highs yesterday. I was pretty bearish of these guys, and they have defied gravity, although giving it up a little bit today and super duper overbought. But hopefully, I know you said hope, but hopefully we'll see some follow through there. As you know, I'm a big fan of having the semis confirm what you see in the overall market. Some areas like retail have been doing pretty good in here, especially retail, not so much. As you can see, kind of all over the place. But retail recently traded higher, doing pretty good. But some areas are lagging, like the drugs. So the market, I wouldn't say it's firing at all eight cylinders just yet. But it, as a general statement, especially with the semis breaking out, it has improved. All right. I'm not going to go through, since we're running late, I'm going to hold off on the sector action. Just know that it's still a little mixed but some areas are headed higher. Okay, the question is, what do you think of GDXJ, J-N-U-G? Looks like a high tight flag to me. Okay, GDXJ, GDXJ, that's the juniors, right? Okay, yeah, I'm not a big fan of of like high tight flags, I hear you. If you, you're in a bull market that goes up and then has shallow, shallow pullbacks and rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, then maybe so. But when I see a market like this, I see an overbought market and that scares me a little bit. So in a case like this, I'd actually rather see a fairly deep sell off before looking to get long again. If anything, and I hate to say it, but like Linda Rasky talked about, the burning dog trade is where you 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 buy something that's super duper overbought or sell something that's super duper oversold on an opening gap. At least that's how I define the burning dog. And it's like you're putting your face in the fire. It's kind of a scary trade to trade to take, especially for a trend trader. But if anything, if this thing gapped much, much higher, like well above 40, I would consider taking a short there. Now Am I bullish? Yes, this looks good, but wait for a pullback, okay? J-N-U-G. Oh, okay, this is just three times gold miners. Yeah, what's the what's the other one? Is it dust or one of these? Um, what's the inverse? I have it on my other screen right now. Again, 
this is going to sound like I'm talking on both sides of my mouth. This is a trend nugget. Okay, thank you. As a trend trader, but if this were to gap sharply lower, I might consider an opening gap reversal day trade. That's an S&G type of trade. I do not risk 2% of my account on those things. I risk a much smaller amount, maybe one half max. But yeah, those stocks, those sectors are headed higher. So we need to figure out a place to get on them. Okay. And obviously not fight the trend unless, of course, we're just taking a day trade. NIO, the problem with NIO is, and I know maybe it's a good problem to have, but you have a ton of overhead supply here and a ton of overhead supply here. So this stock's got its work cut out for it. Okay. So I would pass based on that. Yeah, if it got to this overhead supply, that would be a pretty good trade. But you want to position yourself for the potential for unlimited gains. So why cap your gains? QTT, that's one I've been liking recently. Let's take a look at what it looks like now. Nope, maybe not. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. It looks like it's bottoming out. Let's see if it's got a bow tie. Yeah, sort of. Uh, maybe let it bow tie and then let's reevaluate it. But for now, it's not really jumping out at me. Uh, sometimes these stocks like this, I like it when they come down here and base for a long, long time and then they can take off. But yeah, I don't see any reason to jump in on that one, Donald. GSX. Yeah, this looks interesting. This looks pretty darn good. In fact, this has decent volume. And so what's one of our criteria? In fact, let's just show, let me show you a simple system here. Let's put in a five-day simple moving average. And what is the Landry Light IPO system say? Well, it says you want to buy a new closing high when the low is greater than the moving average. But Dave, that's right here. Well, there's a caveat. The caveat is it must also close above the high. So yes, any close, and I would give it a little bit of wiggle room above this high, would be a buy in this stock, okay? I sort of hate it when they make these huge wide range bars on day one, but I really can't pick it apart from that. I think it still has, I think it has potential. So yes, good job and high five. KOD. KOD looks pretty good. Um, I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout move here, but it looks pretty good. I'll reevaluate it at the end of the day. Uh, maybe a tiny bit more knockout move, but it looks pretty good. I did a presentation yesterday where I talked about knockout moves, and it should stand out. And this is beginning to stand out. It needs to be a little bit deeper, like maybe to, down to 12 and a half. But definitely put that on your watch list for sure. Good job. You're coming up with some good stocks today. NGD, NGD. Okay, NGD looks interesting. It's... It's a cheap stock. It has a gap here. I'm not crazy about stocks with gaps, but that was a while back. It looks like it's looks like it could probably fill that gap. So that aside, yeah, on a pullback, that looks okay. You're gonna have a lot of golds and silvers that are gonna set up really soon. So make sure you have those on your watch list. Uh, this looks kind of interesting here. So what do we have? Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Now, I have the $20 rule because this is already at 40 something dollars. I wouldn't actually buy it today, but I might keep an eye on it and watch the, the same system we just talked about. You can find that on the website under methodology, www.davelander.com slash members, and then take the methodology course. And under that, we have the IPO setup some of the ipo setups and all the ipo setups are in the ipo course obviously so i would wait for your five day moving average to kick in low grade of the moving average and close at a new high and reevaluate that one nugt yeah this looks good obviously this is the three times but you need a little bit more knockout move a little bit more pull back in here and this is the type of open a gap reverse so i'd much rather trade if this thing, if we came in here and this thing got annihilated and was down here like at 30 and then begin to reverse, that would be a day trade worth taking. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Sven, I can't pull that up because it's UK stock. But if you send me a chart, do a screen capture, send me a chart, I'll 
be happy to discuss it in the Facebook group or Q&A or next week of charts or whatever. Okay, well, I'm out of time. Uh, sorry I pontificated so much. Uh, hopefully you got something out of it. Sit tight, everyone. Looks like things in general are improving today and notwithstanding. Any unanswered question, you know the routine, daviddavelander.com. If you're a member, then submit it through the members system. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk between now and again, now and then, try to say. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.